During the early 19th century, America was a rapidly growing nation in terms of both size and population. Many territories were acquired and annexed to America through treaties, purchases, and wars, making America become several times its previous size. America was also advancing technologically and, as a result, financially. Industrialization was taking place and key inventions like the cotton gin and steam engine boosted production and transportation of goods. Many factories were being built in New England and Eastern America to process the abundance of farmed goods. In the West, the frontier lifestyle and cowboy Wild West mentality had a huge impact on the culture and icons in America during the early 19th century. However, civil rights issues such as slavery and women's rights caused issue in America. Many writers felt strongly on these issues and made them subjects of their works, leading to an abundance of publications and newspapers supporting civil rights. Aside from the struggle for abolition and civil rights, however, Americans had a general feeling of pride in their country and were hopeful for an ideal future. They were optimistic and held a positive view of destiny to expand and thrive. Prior to the 19th century, American literature essentially mirrored European literature and simply produced works of the same style. However, due to America's newfound optimism and the civil rights movements, American literature began to separate from the shadow of its ancestor and take on its own style with its own ideals, romanticism and nationalism. Writings from the time reflect the lifestyles of Americans and romanticism and nationalism commonly served as themes for these works. This is especially true to popular American fiction written and published then. Hello and welcome to another episode of Night with the Pathfinders. Tonight we'll be finding some paths and books. Let's see what we got. Tautales. And this one's about a frontiersman named Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett loved to brag about the things he could lick, from wildcats to grizzly bears. Sometimes, though, his bragging got him into big trouble. Take the time he got caught in the thunderstorm in the middle of the forest, carrying nothing but a stick. After hiking some ten miles in the rain, he was so hungry he could have wolfed down a hickory stump, roots and all. He began to search through a black thicket for something good to eat. Just as he parted some trees with his stick, he saw two big eyes, staring at him, lit up like a pair of red hot coals. Hello there, I'm Davy Crockett, and I'm real hungry. Which means bad news to any little, warm-blooded, four-legged, squinty-eyed, yellow-bellied creature. Lightning suddenly lit the wood, and Davy got a good look at his dinner. By thunder, he breathed. The hair went up on the back of his neck, and his eyes got as big as dogwood blossoms. Staring bad at him was the big eater of the forest the biggest panther on this side of the Mississippi. He was just sitting there with a pile of bones and skull all around him like pumpkins in a pumpkin patch. The panther just put his head real low like he was about to leap. With disaster staring him in the face, Davy suddenly concentrated on grinding his own teeth until he sounded like a hundred horsepower sawmill. Then he concentrated on growling his own growl until he sounded like five thousand boulders tumbling down a mountainside. As he stepped toward the panther, they were both a grinding and a growling until a final growl and a final grate brought the two together. And there, in the rainy forest, they began wrestling each other for death or dinner. Just as the panther was about to make a chopped meat out of Davy's head, Davy gave him an upward blow under the jaw. He swung him around like a monkey and throttled him by the neck. And he threw him over one shoulder and tore him around by his tail. As Davy was turning the panther into bread though, the big eater yowled for mercy. Okay, fine, fine, said Davy, pending. I'm not about to skin such an amazing fella as yourself, but I'm not about to leave you here to collect any more of them bones and skull neither. I guess you better come home with me and learn some manners. Now that was a great story. That was really exaggerated. Yeah, yeah how did that ever happen? I mean, like, David Crockett was superhuman. He had superhero strength. Yeah, he's like a superhero, bro. Oh, that's... Isn't superheroism a theme of romanticism? It is! So that story was romantic. Ah. He was from Tennessee too. 
American superhero. Hey, that's nationalism. Yeah. Whatever. Let's get into our story. <clears throat> Let's see. Give me a look at this. Mm. Ah, that one. Uh. Oh, this one is Fireside Poetry. Yeah. Cool, huh? Fireside. Meanwhile, impatient to mountain ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride, on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side. Now he gazed at the landscape far and near. Then impetuous stamped the earth, and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old North Church, as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral, and somber and still. And lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes, till full in his sight, a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in the village street, a shape in the moonlight evoke in the dark, and beneath, from the pebbles, in passing a spark, struck out by a steed, flying fearless and fleet, that was all. And yet, due to gloom and delight, the fate of nation was riding that night, and the spark struck out by that steed in its flight, kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic, meeting the ocean tides, and under the outers that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. Wasn't that a great story? Yeah, that was really comforting. Yeah, makes me want to read it by a fire. Fireside? Hey, wasn't that Longfellow guy a fireside poet? Yeah, along with Oliver Wendell Holmes, James Russell Lowell, and John Greenleaf Whittier. But you know, Paul Revere makes me feel really proud to be American. Proud to be an American? Nationalism! Nationalism. Yeah! Next book. Tail. Back in the hollers lived an old woodsman in a one-room cabin with his three dogs. After a day of hunting, the old man finds only a small rabbit to feed himself and his three dogs. Still hungry, the old woodsman begins to doze off. Just as he is about to fall asleep, the awfulest critter he ever did see in his life creeps through a crack between the logs and the wall. The old man cuts off the creature's long tail cooks it and eats it and goes to bed with a full stomach. He is awakened several times throughout the night when the strange creature comes looking for its tail. Tailipo, Tailipo, give me back my Tailipo. Finally, the fur creature sneaks into the old man's bed and tears the man all to pieces. Tailipo, Tailipo, now I've got my Tailipo. That was creepy. That was scary. Totally gothic imagination. I think I heard this before though. That was called told differently. Yeah, that's the thing about folk tales though. Since they're passed on through the generations orally, they get changed and we end up with different versions. Oh. Well, let's recap, shall we? Oh. Folk tales is a general term applied to narrative stories that are traditionally passed on from generation to generation by word of mouth. Most of the time, they tell stories of talking animals and occur in ordinary real life situations. Tall tales is a kind of folk tale. Tall tales are exaggerated stories with implausible elements that can be based on actual people such as Davy Crockett and Johnny Appleseed or can be completely fictional such as Sally Ann, Thunder Ann, Whirlwind and John Henry. These stories serve as inspiration for the frontiersmen as they come across dangers and obstacles in cultivating the wild land. The Fireside Poets include Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, James Russell Lowell, John Greenleaf Whittier, and Oliver Wendell Holmes. Together, the pleasant nature of their poems brought American poetry to a level higher with British poetry. Alright, good job guys. Team cheer. Ready? P. A. F. Go, Go Pathfinders! Pathfinders.